today I will talk a bit about my PhD project. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg. And um, first of all, I will talk a bit about uh, work. Yeah. So about this neutral scattering technique, how it um, basically, how the, what is the idea about this uh, small angle scattering. So basically, um, why do we use uh, neutrons um, for probing like magnetic materials? The thing is that the net electric charge of neutrons is zero. So neutrons can penetrate uh, materials. Even so. And um, due to the magnetic moment of the neutrons, um, when the neutron beam is like coming to the material, it interacts with the magnetic structure of the material. And so the neutrons are scattered in several directions. And um, the neutron scattering experiment, we can then detect with a two dimensional detector, like a scattering image, and um, get some information about um, the inside magnetic structure of such material. And um, so our interest in my PhD uh, project is about the nanoparticles and in the sense of neutron scattering, you can uh, distinguish a nanoparticle as follows. So first of all, you can say you have like nucle nuclear scattering from the nuclear structure of the particle. Um, the nuclear scattering, it's um, the interaction via the strong force of the neutron and the nuclei inside this material. Um, on top of this, we have also the interaction of the neutron with um, the um, yeah, valence electrons in the atoms of the material. So it's due to um, the magnetization of the material. And additionally to this, we also have like nuclear magnetic interference. So yeah, I displayed this somehow with nuclear structure here and this kind of fireball should um, I visualize like a spin structure in such a particle. So we see um, these uh, spin structures could be very complex depending on, um, on which kind of interactions um, play the role or the, the game in, in, in such a material. So um, then I will come to the outline of my talk. First of all, I will talk about some simulation results and about the simulation techniques we are using and um, I will present some of our results from the last years. Um, and on this, in the second step, this is um, the biggest part for the talk today. I will talk about some analytical calculations I did. And these analytical calculations, um, they represent in the end like the simulation data. So that the idea is these um, simulations, they are like large scale simulations. And then with these kind of analytical calculations, we would like to um, get a better understanding um, which kind of effects contribute um, like mainly to the scattering responses we may observe in some experiments. And in the end, I will also talk a bit about what I've done in my research stay here in Lund at Linz and the University of Lund. And I will give some short outlook. So first of all, I could come to the simulations. Um, so basically, this is some overview of how you can see these um, kind of simulations. So you can distinguish it in two parts. The first part is, um, let's say, to really simulate the magnetism inside these materials. So first, you start to define your material when, when you start such simulations. So you say, I have this kind of a crystal structure inside of my uh, material. Um, then I have uh, yes, well defined the interactions between the spins in this material. So, for example, you have like uh, nearest neighbors exchange interactions, uh, magneto dipole interactions, or magneto crystalline anisotropies. And especially in these nanoparticles, also the outer shape of um, the structure plays a role. So, um, on the outer surface, um, for example, of the spherical particle. You also may take into account some surface anisotropy contributions. And um, these contributions may lead to um, additional spin disorder in these kind of materials. So when you've defined your configuration of your material, the next uh, step is to decide uh, which kind of uh, algorithms or numerical methods 
are well suited to um, calculate uh, like the magnetism inside this material. Once you have done this, um, you can you, you can talk about which kind of re results you can calculate. So on the one hand, um, you can calculate like equilibrium spin structures. These are typically spin structures where um, that minimize um, the, the magnetic um, anatomium. Um, you can simulate this material for different applied fields. So you can, for example, simulate the material over the hysteresis loop. You can also simulate phase diagrams where you include temperature or um, you, 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 let's say, vary some material parameters to carry out maybe a spermion phase or these kind of things. Um, on, on, the, on the other hand, you can also like simulate spin dynamics um, where you really get um, time um, and dependent um, spin motion. So this part here above, this is let's say from simulation point of view, it's the biggest part. This costs the, 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 the most time in this uh, kind of uh, calculations. So once you have like done this first part, the second part is then to transfer the results from the magnetic simulation to um, scattering cross sections. So how does this, how it's done? It's um, like you take your, for example, equilibrium spin structures. So it's a data set of magnetization vectors and position data. You have to perform the Fourier transform. And once you've calculated the Fourier transform, you can calculate like a, a 2D sunspot section, or you maybe also are interested in some 1D scattering cross section, or if you do again the inverse Fourier transform, you get some correlation function um, this, that describes like the magnetic correlations um, in the material. So um, for these kind of simulations, there are some established software packages already. So they are widely used. Um, for example, here we have uh, Vampire. This is some software package from the University of York in UK. This is a more um, atomistic kind of software. So here it's really that you can say I have this kind of crystal structure in my material, you can define it. Other software packages like Remax or OOMF, they are called more like micromagnetic um, simulation packages. So there it is like you don't really care now about the crystal structure of the, of the material, but you say um, you have some more um, continuum like formulations. So you say, for example, you have um, two nanometer size cubes. And in such a two nanometer size cube, your magnetization is constant. And then, then you like have this interaction between these cubes and you would like to find energy minimas and how this resulting spin configurations are looking like. So this is the part for the magnetic simulations. There are also several other packages to do these kind of things. Um, for my simulations on the particles, I implemented something myself. And for the Fourier transform, I implemented some CUDA and the your CUDA code. Um, there, I can say from my experience, it's really helpful to do this kind of Fourier transform uh, calculations on a graphics card because this saves you a lot of time. Um, let's say on a, when you calculate on a CPU, it takes maybe two hours. On a GPU, you can reduce it to 15 seconds. So this is a good thing. You should do it like this. And um, yeah. Also for the Fourier transform, you might think um, it would be a good idea to use like fast Fourier transform algorithms. But um, for these fast Fourier algorithms, the thing is, of course, they are fast, but um, they have a limited resolution in uh, Fourier space. So it's better to use some, some crude force method because then you get some better resolution, especially when you would like to investigate the larger um, structures. So um, yeah, some equations about the magnetic simulations. So this is what I did not equation that I already discussed a bit. So here we have some example for such a magnetic anatomy. This is now discrete anatomy where we have some nearest neighbors exchange interaction. So this exchange interaction want to keep the spins uh, more parallel. And uh, this is for example, the Zeeman interaction this is um, an applied field. So you can apply some field to your material. And um, so the energy minimization 
is uh, performed by, by a system of lambda Lipschitz equation. So you start at some initial configuration, you must uh, propose something, and um, then you uh, calculate like the dynamics of the spins, and they will end up in some equilibrium um, configuration. So you find some stationary state. Um, at the stationary state, we take them and we calculate like scattering response. So this is the, the main equations uh, for such uh, kinetic atomistic simulations. Then uh, the equations for the Fourier transform, and this is now just a basic um, equation set. So you have these data from the simulations, the magnetization vectors and position data. You can, you, you're summing this up in this discrete uh, Fourier transform. And uh, finally, from this you can calculate like the scattering cross section. What um, so this quantity, you can see it like um, a Fourier energy density, uh, magnetic Fourier energy density, something like this. And uh, so you take if you take the volume integral over over this expression, you will get like the magnetic energy in the tube. And um, this quantity, so the scattering cross section, you can measure in such experiments, some small and scattering experiments. Okay, so far, so good. This was a short introduction about the simulation techniques. Now I will talk about some results from our group. So, um, one simulation result we have is for larger iron particles let's say in the diameter size of 40 nanometers in this kind of size range um, we observe also like vortex type spin structures so it's mean that this that you don't have uniformly magnetized uh, particles so the spins are swirling around in some vortex and um, this kind of vortex spin structure it's mainly induced in this case by the magnetohecular interaction so this um, is the main contribution that um, is, is relevant for, for such a spin structure. And um, yeah, here I've also listed which kind of interactions are included in the simulation. So we have um, magnetic dipolar interaction, some um, uniaxial anisotropy, and that's the exchange um, energy. So it's formulated in this in this um, micromagnetic approach because um, this is continuous formulation. And uh, now the question is um, how can we, or, or how does such a vortex type structure look like in the sun's cross section or the related uh, magnetic correlation functions that you can observe in the scattering experiment. And for this, we have here these two plots. So let's first think about some separated particle where the spins are fully polarized. So they are all, let's say, Close, closely uh, parallel oriented. Then um, we see um, these kind of black line. Um, let's say this field of um, neutron scattering from particles, this um, black scattering curve, it's typically called um, the spherical shape factor or the spherical form factor. That, so that's what you see here. And um, so basically here you see just the shape of the particle when it's fully separated. And um, when you go then to some lower fields, so let's say in the zero field, the Raman state, where these kind of vortex type structures appear, you will see that um, like this scattering, um, scattering response will decrease at low Qs. And um, we also see these minimas, they are shifted to larger Q values. And yeah, we have here some maxima. So these are, let's say, the main features will observe from these kind of spin structures. If we do now the inverse Fourier transform back to real space to get some correlation functions, we see for these vortex type spin structures this oscillatory like curve. So this is a really um, prominent feature with these kind of, let's say, symmetries of spin structures. So I can think about why 
do we get here negative correlations? Because that's the basic thing why, why we get this oscillatory behavior. Is when you think about a correlation of two um, you know, vortex times split structures in a particle. So here's this, this uh, vortex that spin structure inside the apple, for example. Now you take a ghost particle and you do the correlation. So they are shifted over each other, they have some overlap and you integrate over it. And if you think now about, about a vortex, what you have is in, in the real particle, spins are pointing in this direction, or this, and in the ghost particle, the spins are pointing in this direction. So you get some um, anti-parallel correlation. And from this anti-parallel correlation, we get then these negative um, values in this correlation function. That's um, why you observe this. So this is really the dominant feature that is really related to these um, vortex step structures. And um, yeah, if you would like to investigate these structures, <coughs> this is what you should look for. Um, yeah, so these vortex type structures, you can see them as a big feature in the particles. And um, if you go to, let's say, smaller nanoparticles, the thing is um, that the dipolar interaction becomes less um, dominant because um, the total magnetization is not that large anymore. So we have a smaller particle. And um, like the inhomogeneities in spin structures are then more induced from surface effects of the particle. That's the idea. So um, one example here was this uh, simulation with uh, uh, the L surface anisotropy. So what we do, we have this discrete Hamiltonian. Then take into account the nearest neighbor's exchange interaction. We have uh, the Zeeman interaction for the applied field and some anisotropy um, contribution. And this anisotropy contribution we distinguish between the core and the surface of the particle. So in core, here we, we take the uniaxial anisotropy, this, this kind of term. And on the surface, we take now this, uh, what is called the L model. So this is the, the L surface anisotropy, which depends also on which kind of outer shape of your particle you take. So if you take a cubic particle or a spherical particle, then you get, of course, different results because they have different, um, um, yeah, yeah, different ordering on the, on the surface. So, and um, now you see in this example spin structure <laughs> that um, this is in com comparison to the vortex type structure, uh, less dominant or a smaller feature in the, in the inhomogeneity. So, then the idea is, of course, also here that the features we will observe in the sunspot section are also not that dominant anymore. And what you see is now in this um, sunspot section. Um, so the orange curve, it's like the fully polarized state. So here is the uniform matter test um, case. This is the, you see these, these typical uh, form factor oscillations really sharply. And when you increase now the surface anisotropy, so then it starts that you get some inhomogeneities in your spin structure. And you see that um, these sharp oscillatory peaks, they are smeared out and also shifted to some, yeah, here in this case, the higher Q values. If you take a, a different um, surface anisotropy model, it could also be that, that they are shifted to smaller Q values. So it's not clear from the beginning um, to say why is it now shifting to higher Q values or shifting to lower Q values. It's not that um, clear uh, to say. Of course, it's now the simulation result. And um, in the next steps uh, where I do this uh, analytical calculation, there's the idea to get more insights about why it comes like this, for example. So yeah, so these were two publications we did in the last year. This was on one side the simulation paper. On the other side, I also tried some analytical calculations here. We use some uh, spherical harmonics approach to solve um, like the, the magnetization distribution um, analytically. So this was some kind of perturbation theory 
to solve these micro mathematical uh, equations. Yeah, this was also some result from the simulations. We can so this is now simulation of a hysteresis loop. And we see here now one particle, so one of these particles. So in the simulation, we take into account several particles with average genie size. And um, here we see the one dimensional scattering response. How it changes now with different um, applied fields. So here you see the applied field and the average mathematization. And um, this is now the 2D spin flip transfer section. So in the fully polarized state, you see this uh, fourfold like um, shape. And now if you come to the to the state where we um, where we have the magnetization reversal, we observe um, yeah quite different um, scattering patterns. So this is uh, one idea for the next project um, with the collaboration of the uh, Sabrina Dish Group from University of Duisburg. Um, because um, they can prepare some, some samples and the idea is then to make some, some measurements at uh, PSI or ILL. So we have some proposal uh, at PSI. So um, to display, um, Maybe on a because of one dimensional function, it's sometimes better to, to understand. So, this is um, this here is now like this. So, um, basically, in the we can distinguish, let's say, between the core of the particle. So, in this cyan colored, we can say this is somehow the core of the particle. There, you see, you don't have that much um, spin deviations from the average optimization. So this is like a deviation angle of the local spin in some um, uh, slice of the particle. And um, on the surface of the particle, we see that we then have uh, more spin deviations. This is also um, how it is currently done. So in this um, more analytical or easy, simple analytical models to fit some Scattering, scatter, scattering data from nanoparticles. It's like this that you take a ferromagnetic core and you say that you have a shell where the magnetization is reduced. And um, often, depending on your sample, this already fits um, the data quite good. So, this was now about the um, simulation part. Um, so, also, if you have some questions in between, you can just interrupt me. It's no problem. And um, the next step is now, um, I will describe this also some work I carried out um, here in between, some analytical calculations and the idea about some analytical um, models. So now the fun starts with some more equations. Yeah, so um, basically, again, the structure of the simulations, you can see it again like this, we have these three steps, micromagnetic simulation, we get a static magnetization vector field, we perform Fourier transform, we can calculate the sun's cross section. The idea is now to split up these steps and say, we just have a look now at this step here and um, see what we can learn from it. Yeah, so here it starts with some equation, sorry for that. So the idea from my side was now to make some kind of power series approach to describe like the um, spin structures in these particles. And you can see it like this. Here we have like the magnetization vector field components. So an X and Y and Z. And now I'm summing up over different particles. So it's like this. This index mu refers to, let's say we have here some particle, here particle, there a particle, here's a particle. So think about this room is split with different particles on different positions. And the positions where the particles are placed, this is basically this uh, vector A here. And this S function, it's like the form factor of the particle. So this is basically just the, it describes the outer shell. For example, if you take this apple, um, it defines inside the apple, this function gives you one, outside, this, outside the apple, it's zero. So this form factor function, I multiply with some uh, power series expansion. And in this 
uh, power series, I can take into account um, inhomogeneities in the spin structure. Now, um, handling all these uh, summation symbols and so on, it's a bit uh, messy. Therefore, I preferred some index notation and some combination of Einstein and multi index notation. So basically, this uh, yeah, expression here is just the same idea like this, just a shorter form to describe it. So here we have this expansion coefficient of the power series, these coefficients. These are the powers. So this is like this bracket here, this product of these um, two different um, coordinates. And we have like the particles form factor. So this is the main idea to start. And um, now from there, from this point, we can um, <coughs> describe what I will show in the next step, the main features that will arise in the sun's cross section. So, okay, now we have the real space maximization vector field. And now comes the funny part. We have to Fourier transform this expression. And here's the good thing that we have these kind of uh, power like expressions. Because um, if you are familiar with Fourier theory, you immediately see, okay, here we can apply like the differentiation theorem and also the shift theorem. So basically, we don't really have to compute the Fourier transform. We can just say this, these powers are transformed to some differential operator. This exponential comes from the shift theorem and the complex uh, unit. Uh, unit uh, comes also from the differentiation theory. So basically, that's already the Fourier transform. So then that's it. So this step was quite easy. And um, here we have now the derivatives of the Fourier transform of this shape factor function. So if we take um, higher order inhomogeneities, um, of, for the spin structure into account, we also get higher order um, derivatives um, that contribute to our expansion. So now we have this uh, magnetization Fourier components. So this is now in Fourier space already. And to describe now the Zanz cross section, as, um, as you know, in, in the Zanz cross section, we lose the information of the phase. So um, what in the end contributes to the sun's cross section are like the correlation um, terms of the magnetization uh, vector field. So then I defined like this um, correlation matrix. And so it's like the products of the magnetization vector components in Fourier space, and one of them is complex conjugate, conjugated. And so from this expression, that then the expression. So this is really the general form. So with this expression, you can choose particle forms as you like, and in the end, you get some results. Um, but the next steps, I will um, specify it, and we uh, will go to some some um, spherical uh, shape. So okay, now once we have these correlation functions, we can adapt them into the sun's cross section. So they are now written here. These are these co correlation components, and that's basically it from the general side. So um, now for, for these studies we've done so far, one assumption was typically that we assume um, an ensemble of dilute um, um, particles. So here we do some, let's say, simplification. We neglect this exponential here, and we say the, the particle forms they are all the same. So we have some modal dispersed um, ensemble of particles. In the sense of uh, scattering, this means that you don't have any inter-particle um, scattering correlations. So these kind of correlations in the scattering response are, are negative. And um, this is basically also then you have to take care about when you're preparing some, some sample, 
that um, your sample also uh, satisfies these kind of approximations. But it's it's widely widely used in this way. Okay, so now we will make it more specific. Now we'll see from this general um, description um, what we can learn about vortex times spin structures and particles. So now we have to start with the spherical form problem. We'll start from here. And we have to go through all of these kind of calculations. But we simplify it immediately at the first step and we say, we just take into account, first of all, the first order terms. So we have the zero order term, the first order term, and we will see um, what we will get from this um, calculation. So now if you're familiar with uh, nanoparticles and scattering, you will you know the first, the zero order term, because this contribution is nothing else than uh, like the form factor of the particle. Let's say if you have a uniformly magnetized particle, you will only have this contribution. And now this contribution comes from the first order inhomogeneities. So you can calculate all these uh, kind of functions. You can separate them in um, angular um, contributions and um, only radial um, um, functions. So these small g's. They only carry the, the information of the radial behavior. And um, these capital G functions, they take into account like the anisotropic um, part um, of these contributions. Okay, so now you continue with these kind of things, putting all these kind of things again together, going to the sunspot section. Here you also take uh, calculate the to leverage. And finally, we get some expression for the IFQ. So this is now an absolutely average sun's perception. And here again, we see this is the zero order contribution from uniformly magnetized particles. This is the first order contribution. And already from, from this um, function, we really can describe the main effects that we also were absorbed, observing in our simulations. So this really worked. Yeah, so here's another comparison again. Um, this were the results from, from these micromagnetic simulations. And here you see now some plots from these analytical um, functions. And what we see is basically if we increase now this I1 coefficient to some certain um, magnitude, then it starts that we also see oscillations in the correlation function um, yeah, from this analytical reason. If we increase it even more, yeah, we, we see that it really gets these kind of um, behavior. Also in the um, absolutely average sunspot section, we also see that for, for example, the ratio of these coefficients of 12, we see that for small Q values, the intensity is really decreasing. So it's really like this, that this first order model already carries the main effect, the main effects of these kind of vortex um, uh, structures. And, and here again, and it's, it's the question maybe now from your side, why is it like this? That already the first order contribution carries main information. And the thing is that it's all about symmetry. So if you think about the straight line, so let's say you think about a coordinate cross, you get linear function. You see in this, this, this area, the linear function may be negative, and here it's positive. And now you can think about in a negative part, spins are pointing this direction, in the positive part, spins are pointing the opposite. So you already have with this linear function, really um, you can describe this um, like vortex type of behavior that's circulating around. If you think about the uh, uh, of your first semester about classical mechanics, just like that you have some rotating solid body, and um, there you know from the center of this body, 
to the, to the outside, your tangential velocity is of course increasing. So there you also have this kind of areas. So it's really like this kind of uh, picture that you can have in your mind. Okay, so now at this point we have described um, the one dimensional uh, functions. Now the next interesting thing is, can we also describe two dimensional scalar responses with the theory? And uh, the answer is yes, but we have to push some more effort um, and more thinking into it. So from some simulation we have seen in these vortex structures that the two dimensional scattering um, has this kind of angular anisotropy. So this was from an ensemble of nanoparticles. This is like the averaged scattering response you will observe from this, uh, this simulation. And um, now the idea is how can we um, describe this by using our theory? Now, again, we start with this um, first order model. So here we now specify like the basic vectorization vector field. We say we have this uniformly contribution, this the, uh, homogeneous part, and we have a first order contribution that's here described as this, um, uh, yeah, this is vortex vector field. So basically, this V function is nothing else than this picture you see here. It's really this vortex. And um, with the ratio of these two coefficients, m0 and m1, we can now switch between uh, the vortex state and the uniform magnetized state. Now, if you just take, take it like this and calculate the sun's cross section, you will not see the image like in simulation. So what you have to do is, so it's also the idea from my side, um, we take now this, and say this is basically one particle. And in a real sample, you have uh, not, have it not like this that all the particles or all the vortices are oriented in, in this direction, but they may be also oriented in this direction or that direction, or that or that or that. So you have some distribution of vortex rotation axis configurations. So what I do is, I take some rotation matrices. I transform this basic vector field with two angles so I can rotate it around in space. I derive again the magnetization coefficients that, I, that we need in our expansion. And um, this is now how we can see it in this linear idea. So this is the, the, the constant part, and this is the linear part of this. Now generalized rotated magnetization vector field. So now we have to work with this, take the equations form, and again to the formalism. So we can do this coefficients, correlation coefficients, back into the two dimensional sums cross section. It is also the helping functions. And um, now you can have this picture in your mind as I explained with this apple. You have, for example, now some critical conical open angle and only above this angle, you say your um, vortices are oriented somehow. So there's some, some point where you stop. And, and this angle, I call it your alpha C, it is also field dependent. So if you apply a really strong field, you might have a small opening angle and all the particles are more closely oriented to your main axis. If you choose a smaller applied field or go to zero field, you have a more, you have more variations. So you take into account more angles. And um, yeah, what we need to do, we need to do now, what we need to do is to calculate the average over this kind of thing. And here I take into account some, or I model it with some uniform distribution in this um, area. And happily, we can solve all the integrals in this thing. And finally, we get really a quite nice expression. It's always good when you get some associated Legendre polynomial. That's always nice to have. And we finally see 
really our theory can describe what we also see in simulations. So now we have this nice analytical expression. It gives you like this picture in the zero field, so in the remnant state. And this is the comparison to the result from the micromagnetic simulation. So um, really with this first order model, you can, let's say, explain the main effects we will observe in uh, from such a sample. Um, yeah, and, and with these two parameters, and zero and, and one, so of course you can vary these parameters now. You can say alpha is also field dependent. So if you go to a high field, let's say, so this is now a uh, scaled applied field variable. So it's now a high field. Then you say, okay, then this conical open angle goes to zero. And then we see the sine square anisotropy that we see from uniformly magnetized particles. If you have zero field and a larger conical open angle, so you have a larger distribution, and then you will see, really see this kind of image. And uh, these two dimensional things, uh, I carried them out in the world, so it's, everything is not published about this. <laughs> so, um, but papers are, let's say, written up to 85 to 90%, so we published this year, I hope so. Yeah, so this was about uh, the vortex particles. And now you can go one step further because now we are at the step where we have a linear uh, approximation. And if you want to describe um, particles with surface anisotropy, I also take into account the second order approximation. So the equation is getting more and more messy again, but you can also calculate this kind of things. And here we'll just show the, the final results. So yeah, the black dots, these are some simulated um, scattering curves. So they are from some uh, simulations on different uh, particles, the surface anisotropy, and the red curves are then fitted uh, to these uh, simulated data. You see al already the second order approximation uh, with this analytical approach it can describe it. And in the second order approach, you have like again seven parameters. So if you think back, in the first order, order approximation, you had only two parameters. But then if you take a second order model, you gain five more parameters. And the thing is, why is it like this? It's because you all also get like correlations from the second order contribution and the zero order contribution. So typically it's like this that you get correlations from um, uh, uh, yeah, even integers and, and, and odd integer contributions. So we don't have a correlation between first order and zero order, but we have correlations between second order and zero order. And these correlations are in, in the fifth and the sixth coefficients. Yeah, so this is the particle radius. All right, so this was tough, a lot of equations. So finally, summary, um, what's the workflow based on what, what have you done? You've described like the nanopart magnetic nanoparticle by a shape function times some non-uniform vector field. We have approximated it with some polynomial expansion. We also use some linear transform to rotate the particles around. We can calculate analytical Fourier transform, and in the end, also get this averaged sans cross section. And we can describe um, these kind of effects. All right, yeah, this was uh, mainly the part about the research topics. And now we'll just finally talk something about um, my research stay here in Lund. So, also did some, started some collaboration with the group of Elizabeth Blackburn. Um, this was on some Y hexafluoride material. Um, this was some yeah, collaboration. I started here and also here we tried some ideas um, or we, we started to try some ideas um, how to get some information about, uh, about some, some, let's say, magnetic ordering in this material. Um, yeah, just to keep it like this briefly. Uh, questions on it later, you can just ask. Then another um, 
contribution I'm working on is like to this uh, Zasview software. So the idea is um, there's a software package uh, we developed in our group last year. Um, and the idea is to merge um, our software package to the SAS, SAS view environment. So this is a software package for scattering data analysis or fitting of uh, scattering curves. It's together with uh, Wojciech Katsubowski. And um, then I also had several talks now in this time. So I had some talk in the beginning in the Lunch University. I was also in Copenhagen in the group of Kim Lefman. It's not today. Um, also, I attended several uh, workshops and um, talks. And there was also a funny thing um, because it's, it's really a nice environment. I really like it here in, at Links and University. It was good. And um, this I read some funny, funny um, story. There was some journalist that contacted him about the uh, like magnets you place on your fridge. And the question was, does these magnetic field rising from them uh, harm your foot and so it gains you some cancer? <laughs> and that was the question. And then Andrew came to me because I was talking to him and uh, calculate some fields and so on. And then asked me, can you calculate when, uh, at, at which distance from magnet, uh, magnetic flux density is below the Earth's magnetic field? So, and these kind of things we did. And uh, yeah, Andrew answered this journalist and then they published like this in some Romanian <laughs> uh, journal. So I cannot read it, but yeah, if you're interested, you can <laughs> look at it. Yeah, it's also a good thing. I started again to do some sports. So I'm happy to do again some 10 kilometer run. That's good to uh, do this kind of thing because uh, last year it was too much of sitting around. And um, yeah, so things is a good place, I think. It's good to get some new tea cup, coffee cup. And um, it's good to, to, to meet new people here and um, to discuss um, science. And there's also with, with Andrew, there's the idea then uh, that, that I will come the next year for three months to Oxford and visit um, there are some people and uh, yeah, really like it from this side. Um, so Outlook, um, yeah, can in the simulation you can always make it more complicated. Um, so my colleague, she's currently simulating some skirmion spin structures in nanoparticles. So there's a VMI interaction included. This is currently a hot discussed topic. Um, yeah, and we have done current, until now so many calculations now, and um, what we also need to do in the future more is also to find uh, more collaborations to do some experiments, to find people that can uh, manufacture samples so that we get some real uh, data. That's all we said eventually for next year. Oh, then I have some acknowledgement. I would like to like uh, to thank Links, so all of you, and um, I'd like to thank my supervisor Andreas Michels, our postdocs um, Matthias, Ivan, my colleague um, Evelyn. She's also a PhD student in Luxembourg. My second supervisor in uh, Sunny Kafkafi from the University of Perpignan, France, and finally I would also like to thank Elizabeth. Thank you very much and thank you all for your kind attention. <laughs>